Hello, David McMillan here. Like most people, I have a loft. In that loft are a lot of boxes, apart from tools I'll never use and suitcases that, uh, well, have been torn to pieces. Anyway, I was a smuggler for 40 years and you'd think there'd be, well, the only photographs that'd be around would be those mug shots that the police submitted with all the rest of the evidence. But no, there's a few things from childhood through to more recent days, and I've tried very hard to hang on to things, but a lot of stuff stashed, buried, in long forgotten self-storage boxes around town, they've gone. But I have about 30 pictures coming up, and I thought I'd run them past you. Well, <laughs> you need some tolerance for this, but then again, there's a few things worth knowing in all of that this picture of money and it's money from a desk in a hotel somewhere I guess I was doing some business and I got paid got paid by people well if you look you'll see quite a few tenors in amongst the twenties banded together to make one thousand pound lumps and every one of those notes has got a story to tell and they could probably be doing something better than they're doing there This is an old diplomatic passport from, well, early 1800s, I think. Yeah, that's for sure. And it's written in French because that was the diplomatic language of the time. And I put a passport there because I've had about 30 of them. None of them that looked like this. But it was the beginning. The beginning of borders that really meant something. And needing papers for wherever you went. We've got that now, and they'll soon be entirely electronic. Creepy, isn't it? Here am I, the little boy just in the middle of the picture, dressed in white, and it's in Hyde Park in London, about 1958, and shot on Kodachrome 25, about the only good movie or home movie video footage you could get. And the film holds even after all these years. That's my mother standing there in the red coat. It was a great time for me. My grandmother's on the right-hand side. I guess that's when you have the idea of happiness. Of course, it disappears pretty quickly. And my sister wasn't entirely sure I was a good idea. But my mother in the red coat says she had me on purpose. Wow. What a mistake. My mother, Rosemary, left Australia rather starry-eyed but with a firm intention of becoming Grace Kelly. Instead of that, she met my father, John McMillan, in London. And he'd not long come out of the army after the war, where he'd been... Uh, running radio programs for a propaganda unit just countering the German propaganda effort. Anyway, he was tangled up in television at the time and became a manager of uh, the forerunner to ITV, which was Rediffusion. They were together, they were in love for a while, but not together long enough for me to grow up and at about two years old. I left. Well, I left for 18 years anyway. But I have these fond pictures. They look good. This sad face belongs to me at 12 years old. I was going to high school and it was before I went to a private school. And I think I earned some money for that by reading kids news evenings. And of course, you can imagine how that went down at the school. Uh, the, the local bullies had something to say about that. Of course, believe it or not, under the jacket I was wearing, an eight-inch knife was there. I never used it, but it made me feel better. Of course, that was an early mistake, but there were many more to come. Back then, 
I really loved science fiction and I could think of nothing better than being off planet Earth. Really, as a kid, I just wanted to get away from people. I would be at my happiest sitting actually underneath an ancient but huge decorative wooden record player, putting my parents' records on there. There'd be old bits of comedy from the 60s and there'd be some music. My mother was a fan of musicals, so I tried my best, but couldn't stomach that. But it'd be like being on some spacecraft, because underneath this huge box of a stereo, the glowing tubes used to radiate warmth. And that's where I really wanted to be, in outer space. This is a, well, a screen grab, I guess, from a still of Mission Improbable, a satire film we made uh, at uh, Caulfield Grammar in Melbourne. The idea was to satirise the Mission Impossible TV show. There's a slight snobbishness there, isn't there? Well, certainly an arrogance. I was about 14 or 15 and already looking for trouble. I could have been destroyed at that age. But then, who couldn't? This is the late 70s. I'm in a hotel room. Not a regular hotel, but actually the top of a pub that kept some rooms. The hotel belonged to Clelia's dad, and you'll meet Clelia in a minute. There, I was making plenty of money. I was not much older than about 20 years old, and a kind of cocky look on my face, I guess. Some kind of big clunky watch I'm wearing, and those silly cuffs. Clelia Vigano was the youngest of four daughters of uh, a Melbourne restaurateur. Well, you can see she was beautiful, but she was the tearaway girl just my type. We kind of hooked up after being friends for a long time and really enjoyed life. Or did we? I'd been with Clelia I guess about a year when this picture was taken at her dad's hotel. We were in love of course and we kind of tried everything. We were looking for adventure. We had the cars, the houses, Lots of things that uh, two million dollars every few months will bring you. But I was careless with her. In my early twenties, I didn't think far enough ahead. Of course, there was always talk about socking the money away and being careful. But in the end, I allowed it to happen through carelessness. She and I were arrested. I wouldn't talk. I couldn't get her out. And within weeks, she was dead in a prison fire. I guess I've never really dealt with that, apart from feeling incredibly guilty, which of course I am. I don't even know where she's been laid to rest. Somewhere in Springvale. I went there once. The police were following me. So I backed off as I must back off from these memories. Clelia and I and uh, a little caravan of uh, friends and followers set out on a journey that was meant to imitate the old Silk Road. This is one of the tent arrangements we had for our travels. Imagining myself to be Alexander the Great as I crossed borders from Baluchistan into Pakistan and then across to Afghanistan, which could be where this is. It was a great trip, but we never quite got to Rome. It was actually Clelia's idea that I should start using couriers, and it worked to an extent. She thought that would protect me. I thought it might, but I stuck closely to them. Here she's looking kind of wistful, but most of the time she was smiling. I just don't seem to have any of those pictures left. I wonder why I hung on to this one for so long. What do 
do you see? What do you see when you look back at pictures of yourself in your 20s? I see a kind of smart-ass arrogance there. It's little wonder the police didn't think much of me and made it a point to be chasing me, which they were by this stage. There was a task force operation, probably about 30 of them working from a secret office. Eventually they caught up with me and there was a six-month trial. I was uh, acquitted of most of the charges, but one was enough for old Judge Murray and I got 10 years. Certainly in my teens I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted power over my own life, just as most people want power over their own lives. How to get it? Money seemed a good start, and I don't suppose I was wrong, but I was kind of ruthless about how I thought I might get that, what I could get away with. I started with travel. When you look at this, you don't think of Asia, do you? This is winter, and it's Copenhagen Airport in Denmark. This is where I would finish my journey from Asia. And that was the idea, that my passport should only show places where the dope would never come from. So a transit flight through there would kill all suspicion. I became fond of that airport, and back in those days, this was in the 80s, it was very useful airport. It mixed transit passengers with departing passengers. Now just think about that for a while. You can do a lot. So it was goodbye to the high life because I was off to prison. Goodbye to all of that, the John Travolta effect. They took the cars, they took the houses, they took the cash, they took everything. They took Clelia. I found myself listening to all the recordings they'd secretly made. Uh, they weren't very harmful, I knew the bugs were there, but you can imagine being in a cell, all concrete, supermax, and all you've got is a crappy little um, cassette player listening to your former life as it plays out from the hidden microphones. You can listen to what's all gone, what's all destroyed, and there was nothing left. In a way, it didn't matter when I was given a big sentence. But there were quite a few things they didn't come to know. What's next, for example? A friend took this picture as we'd gone into the countryside to practice with our guns. Well, I've got plenty of them there, three, and they came from a big warehouse robbery of firearms. There's a 357 in uh, well, I guess holding up my pants and a nine millimeter on one side and a 22 with a silencer on the other. What were all the guns about? Was I running around killing people? No, but it's something you go through when you're young. It's like joining up the army or going to war. If you're sensible, you'll learn that those guns won't do you any good. Just in case you're curious, the, uh, the silencers were handmade by an engineer friend of ours who was on the firm. He was the guy who would unpick locks. In fact, he was uh, sent to locksmithing school for a while just so he could be better at it. He was supposed to be uh, completely trusted, and he knew kind of too much about me which wasn't really great since he took the indemnity and ended up testifying in my court case. But at least he didn't mention these. <laughs> Why should he? After all, he'd made some of them. I'll throw this one in here. Why? Because it's Terry Southern and William S. Burroughs. Big influences on me in the early years. Terry Southern, had, uh, he was a screenplay writer He'd written uh, Dr. Strangelove, in part, and uh, a couple of classic books, including The Magic Christian, about a billionaire who goes around using his money in interesting ways. William Burroughs in the hat. He was probably the most famous junkie of the world at the time. And yeah, quite a good narrating voice, too. But great 60s influence. So how does that fit in? Well. 
do anything was the motto, and that's what we did. There's no cleaning up this picture. There, <laughs> it tells a story, doesn't it? The gloves, so there's no fingerprints. The 357, and if you look very closely, you can see there are hollow points in there. Yes, the, the kind of bullets that open up once they're inside the body. It took me years to learn that none of that would save me and always make things worse. This picture of me in a Mac was taken by some undercover policeman and uh, it must have been just about before my arrest. I was still kind of bright-eyed at then, no matter what I did. Did I know they were out there? Of course I did. But the arrogance was such that I would go on anyway. What could they do? This is Michael and Murray in a car somewhere and it's sure to be in the 70s. Michael looking kind of happy under that big nose. I'd met him by chance and at the time he'd had his heyday long before it had gone. He was running some marijuana out of the River Valley people, the Italians, doing quite well. But of course he got swindled by a business partner, somebody very close to him, and he was kind of, well, if not broken, then certainly vulnerable. He was being attacked by you know, night visitors, we'll call them, home invaders. Well, I met him, uh, put a stop to all the nonsense of the unwelcome visitors, and off he went to uh, become one of the best couriers I've ever had. Well, he became closer than that. Mari was a Colombian girl. Uh, they'd met kind of by chance. She had um, a large family, uh, three sisters, I think, uh, and they were close. She was dedicated. We got along well, and Michael and I stayed friends. Well, forever, until he died, of course. The moustache Michael is wearing just here is not real. It was, uh, it came from a theatrical makeup shop. He had to wear it because I had insisted that he shave his clean for one of his first runs in which he traveled on a passport uh, of my own making. He was very successful at that, but he just couldn't live with himself without that mask of the moustache. So we found him one, and he was happily underneath it. I guess it's detectable. Michael was one of those rare people who, though pretty much straight in some ways, was instinctively against any authority. Even in his early arrest, the police were so confident that he'd crack that he'd talk. They were astonished when he sat in a chair, naked as they had him at the time, for three days without saying a word. You know, it wasn't that he was a hardened criminal so much. He just thought, well, he thought he was above them all. This attitude was not really good when it came to jail time, but that was far in the horizon for Michael at that stage. He just couldn't imagine that kind of life, and it's astonishing that later he survived it at all. This is Tommy, clearly at Christmas with Mari, and I'm pretty sure it's just about the first Christmas, because although he was there for the next, we didn't know it. He was already in some police dungeon. But I get ahead of myself here. Tommy was uh, a legend in the traveling drug smuggling world. He had probably... 55 countries in his passport. He had an address book, which was worth a fortune just by itself. He used to recount a story with glee that uh, he arrived at Zurich Airport once with a suitcase. Customs stopped him because he'd come from Asia. They opened it. It was level to level, 
high-value banknotes. Tommy recounts with happiness that the customs officer just closed the case and said, Welcome to Switzerland. Well, he was. Well, if you're going to prison, and it will happen if you're in the smuggling game, it doesn't all have to be awful. Here is a well, triptych, I guess, three pictures joined together of my prison cell in uh, a country prison, low security. Uh, there's my desk, uh, there's a computer tucked in there somewhere, a pretty comfortable bed, and of course uh, that TV is next to a doorway, which is the ensuite bathroom. Now, not everybody has such arrangements in prison, not in the Western world anyway, and really you can get it. Um, that's the object. When you go into that prison, start day one. Find yourself the best place to live in there. Doesn't mean you've got to be a complete toady, but of course, you've got to offer them something. While I was at this place, it was a kind of a, a country farm in uh, rural Victoria in Australia, and uh, I ran the cafe there. Uh, I remember the prison warden governor handing me the keys to the place, including the cash register, and saying, well, listen, David, you run this place how you want, but it has to turn a profit and he eyed me there, but don't let those bastards anywhere near these keys. I thought, of course, he meant the prisoners, but he didn't at all. He meant his own staff. He didn't want the officers coming down and helping themselves. I kind of enjoyed my time there as much as one can. I think I've got an old copy of Rolling Stone on my bed and some other little gizmo. I was up to no good, of course. I got day leaves and went about. This was, uh, uh, well, hell, ten years into the big stretch. So I'd been through the worst of it. So I guess I deserved a little bit of comfort. Yes. As I say, I'd been about uh, into the tenth year of the long stretch. How old would I have been? early 30s and it would have been 1992. I've set this picture up kind of carefully so the, the mirror reflected off. Anyway, from my little cabin in the in the woods there of that prison, I used to go into town. Now, things were going fine. I was due for release. I had uh, great schemes all lined up. Even had a couple of passports just about ready. But I poisoned myself. How? I broke the communications rule. I made a careless phone call from the wrong kind of phone to one of Sydney's biggest dealers. He was uh, Romanian, actually. Now, you'd think this guy would have been solid as a rock. He had a lot to lose. But then again, that's something to keep in mind. Watch out for those people who've got a lot to lose. They can be pretty ruthless and calculating. Yeah, he sold me out. But I didn't know that at this stage. I'm just sitting in my uh, blue robe there thinking, well, what will today bring? God damn. Well, what's the first thing that uh, a drug dealer gets when he has a bit of money? A flash car, and I was no exception. But this um, Ford Landau from uh, the late 70s, it's worth throwing in the picture. It had some headlights that kind of concealed under those flaps. And a big fat engine, of course, a 3.7 litre mount, or maybe more. It was a V8 anyway. And this uh, Triumph Stag which, uh, next to it, which was clearly um, uh, They took it all. They took everything. Uh, who? The confiscation. Yay. A confiscation is an interesting thing. It, um, it's supposedly to make restitution to those who've lost something uh, in a robbery. But when it comes to narcotics, the state gets everything. Um, confiscated because, what, the money is now poisoned? Hmm. Well, they certainly spend it anyway, don't they? Pity about that car. I've included this picture that I took on top of the Dusitani Hotel in Bangkok, Thailand. 
not because it's particularly great uh, you can see the Chapraya River just on the left there and uh, I should have been kind of higher up it was taken with an old 4 by 5 inch uh, aerial camera though it's been transferred a few times but that's not the point uh, this building was the highest I could get to uh, and sneak out of the air vents at the top to take pictures and why do I mention it? Because after my arrest in Thailand, when I was in the jail and thinking of the darkest depths of suicide, you know what I wanted to do? Escape, sure, but not to get away, but to go to that hotel, go to the top floor, creep out onto the ledge. Take the picture? No, I wanted to jump. I just had enough over a decade in high security prisons and then arrested three days after I left Australia heading for Europe with just a stop in Bangkok to destroy myself. Yeah, what a view. There's a reason I'll throw up this uh, very grainy uh, black and white image of myself. Uh, if it was wider you'd see me holding a plastic bag and I'm being lit out from the Chinatown police station in Bangkok for I'd been arrested seven days before that's how long they keep you in the local lockup there how do I look well a girlfriend I had at the time said I I kind of looked dignified well I didn't feel that way I uh, felt pretty much broken but a cameraman came in he was a stringer for the nine network in Australia and um, said, look, uh, maybe you don't want to be filmed, but at least your family know you're okay. Well, I let him do it because never stand in the way of a journalist. Let them go for it. Um, but the point is, um, would a family feel better? Uh, what's in the evening news? Oh, nothing much. There's a uh, bit of a storm south. And, oh, yeah. Cousin Johnny is being led away from a police station in Thailand, eh? facing execution soon. Yeah, that really would make the family feel better. I suppose we've all had uh, early influences and childhood heroes, but this guy, he stayed with me forever. Good old Daffy Duck, especially when he was a salesman for the East Novelty Company of Walla Walla, Washington, a company that I think I registered once. Well, old Daffy there, he, uh, as a traveling salesman, he went out to sell some major crook, um, anything from his big bag of rubbish. And so the crook says, well, big swarthy man, yeah, have you got brass knuckles? My brass knuckles, says Daffy. Uh, and he hands them over to the big guy, the palooka, and says, well, there you are, best brass knuckles you can get. I'd sure hate to get hit by those babies. <laughs> and you know what comes next. Uh, there's another Daffy story. I, but it ends up being, oh, I won't tell it, hell. The punchline to it is this. You never know what you can do until you've got a gun pointed at your head. Try and chase those old Warner Brothers cartoons. They've got everything from smoking marijuana with Speedy Gonzales to, well, even creepier uh, experiences with blackmail with the hungry dogs. But let's not get distracted. Onward and downward, I say. Yes, a classic portrait type shot taken by some professional. And do you know when this was taken? I was 37, I recall. I wasn't even out of the big stretch. I was still in the big house. But on my day's leave, uh, I had this kind of uh, mug sh thoughtful mugshot, we'll call it, taken. And uh, I suppose it was like uh, Papillon looking through the trap door in the cell. He turns to his cellmate and after years in Devil's Island in solitary and says, how do I look? <laughs> I guess I wanted to know. Well, it seems I'd survived. Funny thing about that uh, that day out after so many years. I went to a delicatessen, and even though it was all those years ago, I could tell you every single thing in that shop that I could see. 
everything from the hanging salamis to the big boxed panettone, which I like with champagne. Should try it sometime. Jumping around here a bit, but I shouldn't really use those words because you can't jump too much if you're wearing leg irons. And these are the kind you get attached to your feet when you move anywhere outside of the prison in Bangkok, Thailand. As you can see, the C rings around the ankle are, uh, well, how would they be put on? They'd be squeezed on by a machine, but mostly hammered on by, a, well, a guy that you hope has very steady hands. In fact, a few cigarettes uh, bung to him before he puts your chains on as you go to court. A few cigarettes will steady that hand, that's for sure. Mind you, uh, I see the guy in front of the picture has only got one chain on because, uh, well, I guess he forgot to have some cigarettes with him last time he had the chain put on. My, that's got a curve to it. You've got to take a look inside the uh, Thai cells. This is a dormitory. Now, this was taken back, uh, of course, in, uh, let's see, the early 80s. And uh, there's really just one guy vaguely awake. I think he was uh, Iranian. Well, everybody was everything. It didn't matter what their passport said. Now, that cell was supposed to have, I think, about 48 people sleeping on the floor. But it had 164. And because you're only outside for a few hours every day, you bring your washing upstairs. Um, not much of a decoration. Somewhere, oh yes, you can see some people who are living in the walkway in between there. Right, people lying down on the right and out of frame people on the left in the same way, but the low class rent, uh, the, the cheap rent was down in that corridor there. Uh, yeah, so uh, I had to get out of there somewhere. And that I did, I moved to a better place. Something with uh, a cell I could control. Right. This is, this aerial photograph, uh, filched from Google Earth. It shows Klong Prem prison, uh, the, probably the biggest in Thailand, uh, one of the big two Bangkok prisons. And you can see how massive it is. If you look center, you can see a kind of cartwheel thing. Well, those are, uh, they look like four buildings, but in fact, there's six stretching around there, each holding something like 1,500 prisoners. I was down in that cartwheel. Did I know it at the time? I had no idea. All I could see as I came from uh, the main road, which is, uh, down front where the blue dot is, uh, I knew there was a moat. I, it was before the age when you could look things up like that. I asked my friends to kind of walk around the place, but they couldn't help me. But I knew I had a lot of buildings to climb over and then that moat to deal with. By the way, uh, over in the back there was a lot of... Uh, staff accommodation, something like uh, 800 houses where the prison guards live. Pretty much in any direction you go, uh, it doesn't get better. On the left is the, the women's prison, by the way. And my friend Martin actually made a telescope by spinning resin while it was still liquid in an old LP record player. That spinning made a curve and he made the telescope and, well, he pretty much let the guys line up and see what? See pretty much nothing, just their own imagination. I've described this letter in uh, Escape and in detail in Unforgiving Destiny, the latest book, but it's better if you picture it here and even close in a bit. You can see the letter has its struts made of, um, well, they're picture frames. My Swedish friend pretended an interest in oil painting and he had to make up those frames. The bamboo poles, there's four of them, joined end to end with gaffer tape. They were used in one of the factories, a, a factory that made little uh, boxes for Chinese funerals. 
made out of paper. They were just offerings of gifts for the dead. Well, I needed every level of that ladder to get over all the walls and it became a very heavy thing to carry. But at least it didn't take too long to assemble, no more than about 25 minutes. I put this newspaper clipping in here, it's from the Melbourne Age, uh, talking about the uh, escape from the Bangkok prison. I noticed there's a diagram there, and it's not very good, but I like the bit that says, guard asleep. I'll leave it there, you can freeze it and read it if you like, but uh, there's nothing of uh, great interest in there. Though other stories said, uh, well, it was bad he escaped because uh, there's always somebody who spoils it for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, spoiled what? Looking back, there are not many people in these pictures who are still alive. Very few, in fact. Most of them dead. I've survived. That has one good thing. I can tell the story of things that have happened in strange places with people that are hard to understand. Some of the hardest to understand have taken me years. But let's go on and watch that face change into the very face that, well, I had coming to me, I suppose. Pretty much the one you see now. Once I got out of the prison in uh, Thailand, and this is where most escapes fall down, I had a fairly good plan of where to go, but no real way of doing it. Uh, this picture went in a new passport and uh, I had that quick enough but I had to leave a trail for the old one, which I assumed they would discover. How? Well, they'd just go through all the names of people who'd left that day, winkle out the Western passports, take those names and compare those names to reportedly lost or stolen passports. Uh, that would give them the one. I knew that, so I then became this person. And I think it was McClintock. Yes, I remember and then traveled to Singapore and then on to Pakistan. Why? Because I had a friend, Lord Magsi, in Baluchistan. Now, if I couldn't be safe there, in the tribal lands, nowhere is safe. This is uh, New York City and Chinatown, and I put this pic in here because I've always quite liked it, but also because if you're in the crook business, if you're in the underworld, you can do worse than have good Chinese friends. The Chinese have been persecuted in the West for a long time and they keep themselves to themselves. They're very good at transferring money, keeping secrets, and they can do things that few other groups can do. That passport that I had to uh, skip Thailand in, the work that went into that, not just changing the picture and putting in the stamps, but entries made onto the national computer to say that I'd entered the country. Well, my time in New York and Chinatown was good, and they were great people, great trust. They would give you things uh, on tick, on credit, and let you pay when you could. As long as you did, you were fine. And they were always willing to put out that hand of friendship. Yeah. Culti cultivate some friends out that way if you can. You never know when you might need them. Or any friend, really. I'd made friends in the 1970s in New York City with uh, Bobby and Bobby Jr. Bobby was a, a captain with a New York mob and he had connections to the Gambino family. Of course, Despite what uh, their publicity says, they're in the dope business, good and strong. But it's kind of competitive in a way that they can't control exactly. So, though they're in it, they're not in it in a domineering way. That's a good thing about the dope business. It's up to the skills of the person involved. The movies will have people shooting each other all over the place. And that certainly didn't happen during my time in the, in the 70s there. And I kept contact with uh, Bobby's son, Bobby Jr. 
and it was quite handy even though we didn't really do much business it was always good to have an ear in that world especially as I was being chased by the USDA this is the German national ID card for Matthias uh, Matthias became my friend from Pakistan and we kept in touch and did a few little gigs together over the years a, a great guy very loyal but a real loner. I sometimes admired his way of looking at the world. He'd do his runs and on a small scale, make a good living, uh, lived in his own kind of bachelor pad world. But he was kind of a depressive and, and quite fearful. He, he really had to fortify himself at an airport. He lived on those very molecules of uh, morphine, alcohol, uh, various kind of oh Xanax he used to take on top of everything else so this framework of drugs used to keep him going and there he's looking kind of bright and chirpy but I think it was a bit of an act his first wife well his only wife killed herself without any explanation and as for Matthias well this is not a teaser but I just don't want to give it away it's worth uh, reading or or listening to Unforgiving Destiny to find out what happens with poor Matty. Matthias, my friend, used to uh, do a bit of hash out of northern Pakistan, and then when he got himself a full-on habit with uh, heroin, he used to get um, he used to get it from Peshawar, which uh, which is a shot of that here. Very tricky place to do business in Peshawar everybody's a spy it's, it's really a bit like one of those uh, Casablanca type places where everybody's up to something you can check into the guest houses there yeah that's somewhat better than a hotel but really you have to drop some clues as to your cover story what you're doing there uh, they won't buy it unless it's pretty good and you don't want them snooping around not in northern Pakistan here we are back in a prison again. This is a, an aerial shot of the Karachi Central Jail. And again, it has a kind of a cartwheel design. That circular thing was called checker, which is also um, the five position on a pair of dice. So I guess it was kind of a nickname. I was over there on the left in what they call B-class accommodation. It's not subclass, it's actually a huge step from C-class, which is the regular stuff. I had a couple of uh, prisoner servants, uh, Adobe Waller for my washing, and uh, Badashi as a kind of general butler. Those guys wanted that job. It really was the only way they could eat. In fact, they had to pay the guards to get the job as servants to the uh, higher class inmates. Somewhere in there, you'll see a couple of private houses built by the really wealthy prisoners. Could I escape from there? Well, take a look at it. What do you think? By the way, the guard towers are manned by rangers uh, from the army. Their job is to keep those hordes out. Yep. There's people in there with such high prices on their heads. The guard's real job with the rifles is to stop people coming in to get them. In fact, one big swindler from the Mehran Bank, he said he preferred life in there. Still, it was a much tougher challenge than Thailand ever was. Who do you think this is? It's a girl on a sunny day in a boat, if you look carefully at the rigging. This is a Tatyana, Russian girl from Krasnodar, Red City in the uh, former USSR but uh, what was she doing in a boat there in Karachi port well she just got out of prison she married some Nigerian guy and uh, things being what they are uh, he had her doing dope runs the next thing uh, she had a little kid with her too uh, and this isn't a, by the way children if you think that having uh, young children with you as you're doing a dope run somehow will put off customs uh, think again 
not only is it absolutely disgraceful to do it, but let's put that aside, as, as I always do. I try not to comment on the, that side of things. But it actually makes them somewhat more suspicious. After all, what's a girl doing in the, in the middle of Pakistan, running around with a kid by herself? Yeah. Well, anyway, she was uh, released, and uh, about the time I was released from the uh, Karachi prison, and a little group of us all used to hang out for a while and have sunny days like this one. Tati went back to Russia, a couple of broken love affairs. I must send her an email if she's still around. I grew this moustache while I was in the Pakistani jail, uh, not so much to blend in, but just to have a kind of identity. Um, it seemed to have a bit more strength that was required and never show any strength in anything unless you absolutely need to. Here I am on a boat at sunset, looking a bit like a pirate, I guess, but I was happy enough. I'd uh, managed to overcome another couple of uh, death penalty issues in, in Karachi with an honest judge, and I was quite happy. This was about the time that I met Jeanette, and Jeanette and I have been together for, well, 20 years now. And that was the first, wasn't it? What was Jeanette doing in Pakistan? Well, she'd come over with the girls, uh, her daughters, to try and help her husband, also named David, who'd been arrested over a two-ton hash case. Well, was there any hash? I doubt it. But it kept him, like it keeps everybody, tangled up in the system there for a couple of years. He eventually managed to deal with it. But it was wearing poor old Jeanette out having to deal with all this stuff. And frankly, I haven't made it any better for her over the years either. Except perhaps today. At what am I pointing when I stand on the uh, slightly moving... Uh, deck of uh, a ship in Karachi port with Jeanette, gesturing towards a new future, <laughs> some land. Yep, does Jeanette look happy? Well, she was. It was a new world, and uh, was I going to make things better? Probably not, but I had lots to do and a lot of past to get over. But we went forward. And we still do. When I returned to England some years after all of this and settled down, I wrote Escape uh, at the behest, really, of Stephen Leather. He's a thriller writer. And he said, well, <clears throat> he'd written a book about a guy who gets out of a, a Thai prison in an escape, but he really didn't get a chance to uh, research it properly. Anyway, uh, I wrote the book. Did it do me any good? Not really. Um, sold a couple of hundred thousand copies and I managed to get some film rights money out of it, even though the film was never made and probably never will. But there's the cover superimposed on old Klong Prem. It's kind of a, a funny read, my first book, and written really in a, in a style that you have to know me to uh, really kind of get that much out of it. Probably my description in Unforgiving Destiny of the Escape is uh, a better description, frankly. Though I'll narrate Escape. I think it'll work better then. I kind of caught my image there in one of those very old-fashioned elevators, those lifts that have the um, sliding mesh doors on them. And I seem to have uh, five faces somehow then and look rather, uh, well, a little bit on the evil side. But it's a good uh, reminder to myself that uh, I'd have to remember which identity I was traveling on. And I certainly liked uh, Scandinavia. The people good there, in, in the underworld, they're, they're very straight too. You can really trust them, good payers right down to the last penny as well. I was doing well there, and it's a very relaxed town. For some reason, go there, uh, say Stockholm or Denmark, you'll be at your most relaxed. This is the most 
civilized part of Europe, really. Some people say boring, but I don't know if you've had a hard time. Uh, go in winter. It's uh, They're prepared for it, unlike uh, Britain, which gets one leaf on a railway track and collapses. But don't get me started on all that. Uh, we're still in Scandinavia, by the way. Looking ahead in the next photo. In Denmark, I did business in a place called uh, Christiania. It was a kind of hippie community. Uh, in fact, uh, an old army barracks, I believe, and they took over it in the um, 70s. It's still there today, but in much modified form. I'm not sure that they have uh, that little set of caravans that sell all the, the dope that they used to call Dealer Street, rather unimaginatively. But the founders of uh, Christiania had uh, a kind of counterculture ethos. Well, it's all a load of tosh, really, but um, a good place to do business. And strangely enough, it's not full of informers, as you might think. And I see there's a bit of a poster over there of uh, Smash the Needle. Uh, I'm not too sure whether they're really telling the truth there. I think possibly that some guy's smashing it because the damn thing's empty. Behind me in this shot is a prison wall. <laughs> surprise, surprise, I'm back in jail, only this time in Copenhagen. You don't see too many prison walls in uh, Danish prisons. 90% of the prisoners are in open prisons. They just don't normally bang you up there in uh, high security. And the walls are actually not that too high. The idea is, if you make escape too difficult, then you encourage hostage taking. Uh, that's, that's actually quite good. And they more or less forgive you for an escape if you stay out of trouble for a few years. I wasn't there too long, and uh, I seem to be pretty healthy there. Well, I'd get out and deal with that in due course. This is actor Toby Schmitz, I think his name is, um, and a still from an Australian uh, telly movie, uh, part of the Underbelly series, this one, The Man Who Got Away. It's not such a bad film, despite having been made in six weeks and with a budget of under two million. A, um, Toby doesn't sound anything like me, but in some ways he managed with almost no preparation time to get uh, a bit of a feel for those times. Uh, it's a sort of a little memento thing, vaguely watchable. Uh, Playlist played by the actress there in a way that isn't remotely like her, but the, I wasn't very helpful. I gave a couple of anecdotes to the scriptwriter, Chris Merkser, but uh, I just didn't know what to do as far as describing Clelia was concerned. I knew it wouldn't work. The fact is, if I'd written the whole story, it would have ended up being a book uh, just about as thick as this one at uh, 15,000 pages, but in telling anything, uh, it's, it's better to pick up the threads where they go through. This was a bit of a little Instagram gag that I had. It didn't help, I, I think people just look at a photograph and they think, oh, uh, that's too much. Anything's too much. Reading's too much. You should try it sometime. Look at the family album. Well, that won't tell you much a bunch of weddings and perhaps even funerals, events that really look fairly miserable. But then there'll be other photographs, there'll be some things that tell a bit of a story. I've tried to find a story in mine, and it doesn't necessarily match the events that happened. But in some places it does. Let's take a look. And where shall we start? We'll start with the goal, the supposed goal and you'll find that that wasn't the goal at all. Just a little reminder here. If you think uh, the criminal world is all about loot, piles of gold, if you go in with that attitude, nothing will work. It's the operation that counts, the love of the operation, the scheme, the plan, the getting around the problems that you have. What shall we do next? Mind you, looking at that, 
Look, anybody who's got any good ideas for how to get to the former Shah of Persia's royal jewels, now held by the new regime in Tehran, let me know. I think I'll come out of retirement for that, that's for sure. But point is, don't think about the loot. Think about the operation. Danny always had a, a favorite line that he used to use when meeting people. Uh, he was presenting himself as the hard man, you know, the, the lad and all of that. But then he'd uh, counterbalance that with, oh, I'm just a poncy actor, me. Uh, I could play uh, anything, a gay aristocrat. Well, I don't think I've ever seen him play a gay aristocrat. Though apparently he is really an aristocrat. He's, he's got royal connections. But I always suspected that. Hi, Dan. Jeanette and I with little Nico, who's now getting on to 11 and has been interrupting these uh, little memoirs attached to these photos here. And Nico is the glue that holds our family together and he's very opinionated. He deserves his own YouTube channel. I'm sure he'd probably get uh, more followers than I ever damn well will. Dave, behave yourself signs off uh, Danny Dyer there. He's got his scowl on uh, and uh, we were filming something for uh, let's see Danny Dyer's Deadliest Men season two. Was I deadly enough? The producers weren't sure. What did they want? Well they just kind of went for it. Uh, I did the thing so I could plug uh, Escape the first book but of course, I was double-crossed in the production and uh, the little scenes filmed with me scribbling away and wistfully looking at the covers of a book all ended up on the editing room floor. As for Danny, yeah, you can spend a day with him and it's good. He was kind of a little tired at the time. He had some uh, dismal vampire movie coming out, most of the budget on prosthetics and uh, it opened to about 300 people and tanked. But he's doing well for himself these days. He's, uh, there's nothing more secure than a, a run on one of the soaps, huh? Wow, steady income for an actor. Best thing ever. I wonder whether he still writes his lines on the palm of his hand. Maybe not. This dolphin and I had had our good times and had our bad times, but as with all cross-species relationships, there comes a time when you've just got to say goodbye. Am I not genuine in this kiss-off? Well, the dolphin seems impressed, or is it just another dollar another day? I look just wet. Just a little tip, uh, Instagram, I have an account, and this montage is kind of one of the a year summary pictures. There's a couple of gags, a couple of nice shots. Lily the cat, uh, I think Waterloo Station. Some uh, poppy fields and local parks. But point is, uh, Instagram is really uh, kind of a waste of time. If you find yourself on it, uh, do something else for crying out loud. I really ration it these days. Oh, and you won't get rich doing it either. Keep that in mind. Jeanette uh, pictured here in uh, some kind of eatery with me uh, has been pretty tolerant over the years and put up with an awful lot of shit from me. Uh, what kind of shit? I mean simply not being here, getting arrested. I won't be doing that anymore, not because I have any uh, uh, moral change or anything like that. All that's irrelevant. The, the dope business is, is uh, ludicrously competitive, full of old eastern blockers, and anyway, I simply ran out of time for that sort of nonsense. If you're going to become a crook, if you're going to go adventuring, make sure you've got some time on your hands, because you'll lose quite a bit. And uh, I've lost enough. Kind of exhausted, I guess I was, by the time I'd got Unforgiving Destiny into print. It's... Uh, and kind of covers, well, nothing covers the whole story, but I hope uh, it covers the pursuit, 
the being hunted as I was uh, throughout the 39 year period of this book. Um, this is taken at my home and uh, it's judging by the light, surely summer. Um, what's next? Well, what's next is time to do something else. There's a line in the Bible that says uh, something like it's easier to get the, oh, that's right, it's easier to thread a camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. Well, here's a scanning electron micrograph of a needle, the eye of a needle. And those few hairs, well, that's the camel I try to push through. Hey, at least I tried. I've enjoyed myself uh, doing some recordings with Sean Atwood, who's got a true crime uh, video channel. Sean Atwood, that is, with two T's. And um, has it been therapeutic, cathartic for me to uh, relive my past on these shows? I doubt it very much, but it, it, if it's been a, a bit of a distraction for anybody, then uh, that's been a good thing. I've got some more recordings coming up with him next week. Um, well, I'm talking about late November and also a, a Christmas edition. I really don't know what we're going to talk about, but uh, probably one of those roundup of alls. What, what's what's interesting about the last year in true crime? Um, you're going to hear a lot about Epstein. Should be Epstein, really, but Epstein. That'll do. Yep, no dodging that one. It's a story that just keeps on giving and Sean's really running with it. Uh, I can understand that. So there you have it. That's all that's left. An old cardboard box with a few pictures on it. I think there's some home movies there that uh, are kicking around as well. I've got some interviews coming up with Sean Atwood. We're going to record at the end of November, which is this month as I speak. And then Christmas 2019. I don't know what we'll do, Sean and I. Probably try and review the year. I don't know whether that makes for uh, great listening or watching, but we'll give it a try. Perhaps see you then. If you'd like a signed copy, one written to you personally, just contact me at davidmcmillan.net and go to the contact page. Tell me something of yourself, and then I'll tell you something of yourself. Damn, did I actually write that? A little bit too much information. I think there's some people who could identify the players in that. You know what I've been doing this afternoon? I've been signing a few copies to go out to some, well, new friends, I guess, people who've contacted me on my website who wanted signed copies. And the reason that they probably wanted them because I write something particular to every person. I ask people to tell me a little about themselves, what they like, what they hate, their favorite moment, their most feared moment, their ambitions, what was their worst experience, just a brief outline. And I try in just a few sentences on the title page to say something that kind of hits the spot. Now, as you probably know, I was a smuggler for 40 years, and that required me to assess people quite quickly. I'd have to know what kind of person they were and how they would react. And if I was wrong in those judgments, I could end up in trouble. And uh, I did end up in trouble, but not often from misjudging people. So, I guess if you want to get away from Trump bogus elections in which there's no one to vote for because they're all charlatans, uh, Epstein, and... Uh, Prince Andy, playing into the hands of every fool in town. If you want to get away from that, in fact, get away from anything to do with regular Christmas stuff, 
Ask me for a signed copy. Tell me a little bit about yourself. And I'd be surprised if I didn't hit the spot. And what you get for 20 quid is a solid 400 pages. Now, you can do a lot with 400 pieces of paper. Well, that's technically 200, but even so. I'll write something for you, and that means you'll be in at the very beginning. Beginning of what, you might ask? Well, something's coming, and I don't want to kill it, but come in now. Well, it's starting to feel a lot like Christmas with a massacre. All right, uh, I'll stop singing. Yeah. Oh, these people were from New Zealand. The guy was getting something for his brother. Yeah. All right, I'll edit the singing bit out of it. Okay, you, you better get on now. I've got some biography stuff. Oh, some old photos I found in the loft. It's going to be slide night next. That seems to go, uh, well, we'll see how that turns out. See you soon.